just John will tell you and we will have just the yeah. minor problem of being able to choose something from his enormous oeuvre. Um, I think John would like you uh, to give the lecture and as he goes on, when there is a question coming up. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for you. Uh, I know mostly what I'm talking about <laughs> and my work. Um, or I'm surprised often when I forget things, but uh, I'm here just for you. So there is a lot of stuff, and it's up to you to decide where the discussion goes or where the lecture goes. And if you have a question, you just ask it, and it's fine. If it goes off topic, we go on to another topic. It's fine. Well, we sort of started. Yes, so, so, exactly. So this is the procedure. Uh, so we, we don't have a lecture break and then question and answering, you measure it all up, and we will have, we take a break when we feel like in the middle of it. So, have fun, enjoy. Thank you. John thank Rose. You. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to concentrate mostly uh, this afternoon on two big projects of mine. One is about fences, playing fences, as a musical instrument, and the other is about bicycle-powered homemade instruments. And if we return to that now, then it's good. Um, but to give you some idea of where I'm coming from, Kirsten thought it would be good if I just explained a little bit about my background. Um, so, I, my main instrument is the violin. And uh, when I was seven, I won a music scholarship, violin and voice, to a kind of snotty school. Actually, it was, they were trying to be a snotty school. They weren't really up there with the really snotty schools. Um, and at the age of 15, I basically gave up my classical music education. That was 1966. So um, I wanted to do other things on the instrument. And one, I wasn't allowed to. And second, I didn't have a clue about how to play any other music on the violin except notation and Western music. So I gave it up, thought there was something wrong with the instrument, came back to it later when I was 19, and then retaught myself from the beginning about what I could do with this instrument. And then I had some sort of confused years in London, trying to figure out what I was doing. The last job I had in London was as the recording engineer for the Royal Academy of Music. Uh, they actually advertised this position in small ads, along with toilet cleaners and traffic attendants, I seem to remember. That's what they thought of recording engineers in the Royal Academy of Music in London. Uh, I went slightly mad and I walked out one day and I got on a plane and I flew to Australia. Um, that's sort of a shortened version of what I did. <coughs> when, I, when I got to Australia, I had this violin and I had this new country and um, there is something, I do recommend it, you know, if you get really depressed and hung up, move. It's a really good thing. Um, by coming to a completely new place, it... it made me formulate exactly what I was going to do with this instrument, which was impossible, namely the violin. And the Germans have got, well, the Germans have got a lot of good words, actually, but one of the ones uh, which is, really gets to it is this word, Gesamtkunstwerk, which means total art form. And there, at the age of 25 in Australia, I decided, in a totally precocious and pretentious way, I was going to rewrite the history of the violin, and, in fact build an entire art form around this classical music instrument. And to kick things off, uh, the first little video sequence is me actually play. I actually thought I was leaving Sydney and I wanted to do some audio postcards. And I thought, well, I'll just play a bit of violin in front of the Opera House. Uh, unknown to me, it's actually illegal to play music in front of the Opera House. And so I was arrested, and this is the <laughs> part of... That and I sort of eventually, as I knew what was going on, I really milked this guy to actually tell me that, as you'll see. You can hear his walkie talkie already. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, um, yeah, that shows you uh, some of the things that I get up to. Um, let's go to history and let's find a few uh, other bits and pieces. That's not me. <laughs> um, one of the things I started to do, let me just stop this for a moment. Um, so with the violin, with, we're trying to formulate a whole art form about this instrument. I went in various ex sort of various extreme uh, ways. The first one was, well, it's what is this instrument? And I actually discovered that in the first years that I was playing it, because it's a very frustrating <coughs> instrument. No matter how good you might get at it, eventually it's hell for the first year for everybody listening and for yourself. It's very. It's an impossible thing. I mean, there are no place we we can find the notes. You have to sort of find all that kind of stuff. And I was very frustrated with this instrument. And I actually picked it up one day and was was like hit the sort of kitchen table with it. Uh, it wasn't like I was trying to destroy it. It was just that I was fed up with it. And the, it was a cheap instrument, it belonged to the school, and it actually fell apart there in front of me. And I realised it was, was actually 70 pieces of wood stuck together by some blow. Before that time, I thought it actually came down from heaven, um, you know, fully formed Baroque splendour with angels blowing trumpets, and it should just sort of arrived like that. It was actually just lumps of wood. And so knowing that, I sort of went forward and started to make my own kinds of instruments, either hacking them, joining together. I'll, I'll show you a few in a moment of what I did. Um, building electronics into it. The first one you'll see is actually a radio station, in effect. I built this, I think, in 1980 or something, 81. Uh, it's an FM radio microphone inside uh, with a 6-watt amplifier and it's sort of with a very cheap but very loud pickup, which sort of makes it sound like a kind of distorted, sort of like a sort of Jimi Hendrix kind of sound. And wherever I went with this, it would sort of basically, um, if anybody was listening to, you know, their favourite Mozart symphony on classic FM or whatever, I would actually often appear uh, in their living rooms um, if they were within about 200, 100 metres of me. And I did other things like join violins together, like Siamese twins. Uh, I had violins that were played by sails, like Aeolian violins, violins that worked with wheels and various kinds of things. So I did, that was part of it. I, I also worked with, apart from analogue electronics, I developed interactive electronics later. Um, I made radio pieces about the instrument. I invented a fictitious family of violin players to sort of accommodate anything that I didn't have the nerve to do myself. And so I just gradually built this world. And the two projects I'm going to talk about in general later, in fact, are not violin <coughs> projects per se, but they come from this central core of work. So just a few more about some of them. And, and that's the other thing I want to concentrate on today is making shit. Like, I know this is very unfashionable, you know. The shit's already made and you regurgitate it and do something with it. But no, I'm about making stuff, and so I want to concentrate on that. Anyway, this is some of the early instruments. This is the double violin. This was actually a, a photograph taken by an artist who was into totally doing sort of Dutch um, golden age sort of fake setups. Unfortunately, she left the telephone in on the left, which rather destroys the uh, illusion. Uh, Aeolian violin. The actual pitches are manip manipulated with the pegs, but the, basically it works like a, like a sailing boat. Anybody who goes sailing, you try to get a good instance to the wind and you can control it quite well. 
What else are we going to put up? So, a lot of my instrument making uh, is inspired by history. Um, and this I call the, the Tromba Marina, which is actually a sort of a, a mixed up uh, piece of linguistics. It's the trumpet marine was an instrument that was invented in the Middle Ages, and it was a very long tube, and it had one string, and you played it just the harmonics, and the bridge, for those of you who are guitarists, uh, went through the front belly, and it went to the back, inside of the back plate, and vibrated and rattled. Um, and, um, and of course, some deranged monks thought it sounded like a trumpet drowning in the sea, hence the name. And so I thought I'd make a real one. So that's actually downpiping from, you know, drainage from a house. And there's strings on there, and I actually put some frets on there. I like strings, so I put more strings on there than one. And you change the sound of the instrument by filling it up with water. So as the water, the more and more water in the length of this tube, which goes down to about here. Um, so the um, focal resonance, if you like, of, of the instrument changed. That was basically it. And you get lots of water sounds and shit. Ah, where else? All right. Now we go to the triple neck wheeling violin. So, I also started to think about, well, music is normally measured in terms of uh, duration, and I got this idea one day, because being in Australia, it's a big place, I thought, what about music measured in terms of distance? So I built an instrument that actually you could play a piece of music that lasted one kilometre, or whatever, you know, if you wanted to do a cage piece, it could be three kilometres, 44 metres. <laughs> um, and so this is somewhere out near Broken Hill, which is like a thousand kilometres west of Sydney, doing sort of various things. Oh, there's a bit of video. This was actually shot on Super 8 film, and um, the sound I synchronized later. This is obviously a bit slowed down. And all of the electronics were on board. Cheap, you know, battery operated, 6 watt. And a really cheesy kind of uh, pitch shifter. Anyway, and this will relate to the second project we're going to talk about later, which is the bicycle-powered instruments. And of course, I was interested in movement and how cha sound changes over in its transmission over space when you move it around. Normally, when we listen to music, even if it's in stereo, we're sitting in one place and it's coming from one point. Once you start to move sound out through space at different speeds, all kinds of effects like Doppler effects and phasing and all kinds of interesting stuff starts to happen. So this will relate to the bicycle project later. And let's maybe kill this now and go to the first main project. So the fence project. <coughs> so part of this sort of instrument meant building business uh, I had a very fecund sort of period at the end of the 70s and early 80s and one sort of a thing that was intriguing me, particularly because you play the violin which is a shitty little instrument with short strings was what happens when the strings get longer and longer 
So I started to build longer and longer instruments. And eventually I had instruments in galleries which were as long as the gallery. And so I was, you know, I was using uh, fence uh, wire and um, also used piano wire when I had the money. It was a bit more expensive. Um, and then I was out in the outback uh, one time and the penny sort of dropped. Like, why was I making uh, long string instruments when the entire continent was covered with string instruments, namely fences. And, uh, and the more I looked into it, the more this became clear to me that Australia was fence central. For example, um, there was a guy, a fenceologist, John Pickard of New South Wales University, he, he estimated that by 1892, there were no less than 2.7 million kilometres of fencing just in New South Wales. So, so the population of, of Australia then was like between four and five million total. So, I mean, there are more fences than anything. There are probably more fences than flies, you know, in Australia. And so uh, the, the issue then was, well, there are all these fences. How, what, what are you going to do? Well, simply, you've got to get out there and play the stuff. And although the initial interest was as material to make pure sound sonic interest. Uh, very soon you, you, you realise that fences are your sort of ultimate metaphor for just about everything that fucks us up as a species. I mean, the whole duality thing, Cartesian thing, them and us, ownership, colonialism, you name it, left and right hemispheres of the brain, it's all in there in a fence. And I sort of just sort of slowly got the picture of this. And of course, in a place like Australia, which is like a, uh, you know, a newly invaded country, let's call it that, it's only like 200, a few years old, um, the fence was vital in terms of taking over this territory. You put your fence up to demarcate your control, your territory, and your power base. Um, of course, people say, well, the fence is also like, you need that because you, the whole place, you're going to fill up with cattle and sheep. Cattle and sheep aren't that stupid. They normally go where there's water. You don't have to fence them in. So fences really are more than just a useful um, tool for economic reasons. Anyway, I'm going to play uh, uh, some cut-ups. I'll probably stop and start as we go through um, to demonstrate the sort of wide variety, sonic wide variety of what you can do with uh, fences as instruments. Um, but... Yeah, we can talk more about the socio-political stuff, if that interests you. Um, meanwhile, let's go to Australia. Oh, God, it's asked me what I want to do. All right. Actually, they wouldn't. I just want you to play, fucker. Just play. Australia's upside down. Um, so um, there's just the, the two sounds you're hearing. Uh, they're, they're, they're two fences. One I'm just playing with my hands, and the other one I'm playing with a bow. Uh, there is no electronics in there at all. That's just the sound. And that's very close to. Well, that's yeah. That's 
that's still in New South Wales. That's not even the centre of Australia there. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna shift around. It doesn't look very professional, I know. But uh, here's my long-suffering uh, partner and wife playing a fence. <laughs> so, uh, I should say that before she actually plays anything, that's that's a record. This is recorded with contact microphones and an air, air mic. And since you hear the flies and stuff, um, and it's about five o'clock in the morning. This actually was a concert, believe it or not. There's, <laughs> the other side of the camera, there's a hundred people sitting there. And the, the place is on a station called Wagana Station. It's like uh, 800 kilometers east of Perth. And this is a sheep station, but it actually we, there were a lot of concerts that we did there, a lot of performances, a lot of festivals, in fact, including the first time we did a festival there, we ended up with a, a, an extreme amount of people, 700 people turned up this was in the middle of nowhere uh, for, a new, for a concert of new music, I think they thought they were going to their own sort of Woodstock or something, I, I don't know what they thought, but anyway this is what they got <laughs> this just doesn't want to respond, this clicker hmm oh. no I think if you click on the left side of the mouse pad rather than the Oh, I see you've been here before. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> totally all right. You learn something new every day. Oh, this is a pretty awesome part of Australia. This is the Streslecki track. <coughs> Again, this is this is live sound. There's no electronic treatments. This is
So that that's as you can see down the other side of the sand dune. That that's probably about thirty to forty meters away. Um, but the recording, the contact microphones are right up close where the uh, where the camera is, and so that sound is travelling like audibly along a very straight stretch. And that's the thing about fences. I mean, you can get like an old fence which is. Uh, Trashed, uh, the tension's gone, and it doesn't make much of a sound. I mean, every, everything makes a sound, right? But um, whether it's more than just an, uh, an artifact which is lying there, is, it depends on the condition. This fence is in quite good condition. For some unknown, ridiculous reason, a guy's put up a fairly new fence in the middle of a desert on a sand dune. Um, a mystery. Um, uh, but but a, a fence. Uh, Obviously, the, the strings are so long, they're not just the resonator. You know, when you play the guitar, there's a string and that, hit, that makes the resonator sound, the body of the thing. In a fence, the, the actual wires also become the resonators, as well as the triggers, if you like. So, uh, they do have an acoustic property, and uh, like a really good fence will sound as loud as a, as a, as a violin. Um, and this one had, you know, I've, obviously you get a bottom end frequency response and all this other stuff because there's contact microphones on there. I mean, all those sounds are there, but you don't hear the bottom frequencies, of course, in, in the, the general acoustic environment. Oh, here's another one. have always thought of Australia as a good place for a jail and, um, and the Australian, present Australian government is no different. So right very close to here we have a, a con basically a con small scale concentration camp where we put all the people who want to come to Australia but are doing it um, without the permission. And uh, just to put you in the context of what goes on just down the road there. Um, also very close to here is another amazing fence uh, which is called the dog fence. The dog fence is probably might be the longest artifact in the world. I don't know. It's, it's 3,500 miles long. Uh, it is twice, that makes it twice as long as the Great Wall of China. So um, there might be a, the odd oil pipeline that's as long as that or, or what. But anyway, so the dog fence was put there to keep the wild dogs, the dingoes, away from uh, the, the sheep primarily. And that goes across Australia. There's another one you might have even seen a movie called The Rabbit Proof Fence, mm -hmm. the most god awful music by Peter Gabriel. Um, um, anyway, uh, that, that fence was uh, did there to keep what it says, to keep the rabbits out. Um, of course, we brought the rabbits to Australia in the first place. Uh, some farmer who just brought 12 rabbits because he wanted to shoot rabbits instead of kangaroos. And lo and behold, 10, ten years later, there's millions of them. Like, Anyway, so in Western Australia, they thought they'd build a fence to keep out the rabbits. And so they started this fence in 1901. And, and 400 guys um, set out from Starvation, suitably named Starvation Bay in the south, uh, a very dismal kind of place, and made their way north, um, building this fence. And as they were making their way, way north, building the fence, they could see the rabbits were already jumping in, you know, across the line of the fence that we made. But this was the British Empire, after all, so they would finish the job, you know. So they actually, once the rabbits were in Western Australia, they fenced them in, in effect. <laughs> By the time they reached the top end, which was four years later, and several people had died and all kinds of catastrophes had happened, the, fence, the rabbits were already there. So they built another three rabbit-proof fences to try to keep them out of certain parts of it. I think there are eight rabbit-proof fences altogether in... Um, Western Australia. Now they're sort of used 
Uh, actually, air, air, um, pilots use them to, to navigate by. They sort of have other kind of uses, but they've long been forgotten that rabbits are, you know, the original intent. There's a bit of a digression, one moment. Anyway. Um, oh, this is nice. Okay, this is a Cuba PD. Um, this, this is an Aeolian, what you hear is only Aeolian sound of the fence. And Cooper Peely is this, is this mining town in the centre of Australia where um, everybody lives underground because it's just too damn hot to live above ground. And they dig opals. And it's this sort of moonscape of like insanity that sort of covers a, a huge area as far as you can see. And um, this is, in, and it's not, the, the film hasn't been changed. This is the colour of Cooper Peely. Australia, that the, 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 it's, it's, there's a lot of wind and there's a lot of trash, and so plastic just sort of gets hung up on fences or wherever you go. It's like an amazing sort of another sonic artifact, that, an unexpected one. You probably, when you think of Australia, you don't think of plastic bags <laughs> um, rattling like that with an Aeolian fence. I mean, the chance of putting those two things together if you're a sound artist going, what should I put with this Aeolian fence? Oh, I know, a plastic bag. Not very likely, you know. So these things are there in the environment and to be discovered, let's say. Where else are we going? Oh, this is amazing. Yeah, okay. So. Click on this. <laughs> from an Aboriginal uh, town way up on, in the north um, saying, would we come and do the fence project in their town? And um, it's a surprising kind of request, considering the fence is the one methodology by which we sort of completely screwed up their way of life and took over their country. Um, so, but they, they were interested somehow in it. And so we went up there and uh, they'd agreed they were going to put a fence in the centre of the town and we were going to play it. And uh, so the, the, the town kind of guy who fixed things dug a couple of holes, put in these two fence posts, and we started to get ready. And, and, and in, towards the evening, like uh, about 20 or 30 women gathered around with like very kind of sour faces. And uh, I thought, oh God, we've walked into some sort of cultural catastrophe here. And I asked them what was wrong, and they said, well, you... You can't use those fence posts. And I said, why? Because they're, they're dead. And I said, yeah, I know, they're fence posts, they have to be dead. And I said, well, you can't make music on something that's dead. And I said, uh, yeah, okay, um, suggestions? <laughs> so they said, well, we have to paint them up and bring them back to life again, and then it will be all right. I, 
I thought, well, that's just totally amazing because, I mean, this was an added bonus which wasn't expected. <laughs> so they, um, they set about painting up um, the correct sort of... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, icon iconography for the time, for the season and for the place. Um, and we went ahead with it and it was like the most ex kind of extraordinary thing. And it, t if you tell people, like, you know, a fence post is dead, you can't paint music on it. I mean, this is so far removed from our position in the Western world where we can basically cut and paste any kind of sound we bloody well want. And, you know, to you, if you've, if you've got the copyright, you know, we just have it. Uh, and and it, it brings into question, um, not a question, in, into, the, into the debate, um, this whole view of the world and a traditional Aboriginal view of the world is something which is so far removed from where we are now I mean on, on, a, on a continuum in a sense that um, in a traditional society if I, if I don't know the song for this cup it doesn't exist it's a pretty far place to go but that's, that's what music means in a traditional 40 to 60 thousand year old culture you need to know the music for every single thing. Every day you have to sing the universe into existence. Everything uh, is, a, is, is linked in kinship. It's not just your relations are humans that are alive now. The first thing you've got to do when you go to an agricultural town is meet all the aunties and the uncles and make sure you're you know, lined up with whoever's with what. And, um, and so the, their, their concept... Of, of this sort of continuity and, and set of relationships is, goes completely over everything. Every animate and inanimate object, I mean, every animal, every tree, every mountain, every stream, uh, humans alive, ancestors, mythological creatures, the whole thing is in one big stew pot and completely linked and connected. That's all kinship. And so music is part of the functional necessity to make this stuff happen and to make these connections. If you want to go from A to B, you need to know the right songs to get from this from one country to another country. There's an illusion that, that in Aboriginal culture they're all sort of wandering around like, you know. Uh, they're not. They're actually on their own countries. Uh, when the British turned up in 1788 to conquer them, there were 650 language groups in Australia, it's estimated, and probably three to four hundred different countries, you know, unique countries. And so this all plays, this connectivity is what one of the things that gets me going about music, my sort of view of music now and the practice of music now, which we can come back later, but I mean, since we've arrived at this point <laughs> somehow, um, is that it, it should be functional. And... Uh, one reason why music, you know, musicians such as myself has such a like impossible time trying to earn a living is because basically the value of music it, it's, it's lost its value. People like to have the stuff, but they don't want to pay for it. They certainly don't want to pay to keep a, a musician alive. You know what it costs to put a musician on the stage, for example. So, so our, our a lot and music's not just one thing. It's just one of the first professions to be hollowed mm -hmm. out. That's all. Uh, it, it'll get down the line. The bankers will be hollowed out too. You know. It's going to catch up with everybody. You know. There'll be no it, politicians. They're all in the line. They're all going to get hollowed out. And this, so, but music was one of the first ones we could get rid of. Get rid of the musicians, no problem. And and so that's at one end of this continuum. And at the other end is what I've just suggested in terms of traditional culture. You know, where you cannot function without music or sound. And and also the other thing is that this which is, in a historical sense, like compared with, with European music and what European music meant. Originally, European music was just like Aboriginal music, but it became something you could sit down and listen to. Uh, in Aboriginal culture, it's almost impossible to separate music out from its function, uh, 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 separate out from the poetry, separate out from you can't, from dancing. You really can't have music without having dance. They just go together, as they always did. I mean, even in Western music, you look at the the suites of Bach and the symphonies of Mozart. They're all dance music. It's all dance music. It's only later it becomes. In the last really two hundred fifty years, does the whole thing 
become the kind of idea of music as we understand it, which is a sort of take it or leave it kind of uh, evening choice taste, you know, shall we go and do music or shall we go and have a meal or shall we have sex, whatever it is, it's like, you know, it's a choice. So that, I sort of put that in now because that's my, yeah, that's the moral, the moral bit. Um, meanwhile, good afternoon. Um, I'll just keep going with some of the sounds for those who just... So, I mean, the, the basic waveform of a string is, is a sawtooth wave pattern for those, and, and with a bowed string, I mean. And that sort of basically means that the bow is slip, hold, slip, hold, slip, hold, slip, hold. That's how a violin works, that's how a double bass works, and that's how a <laughs> fence wire works too. And there it's actually to be seen. It's really a slip, hold, slip, hold at a very sort of slowed down level. Although the film is not slowed down, it's just I got to be able to make this technique where you could actually do it. <laughs> to the string. This is pl this is not in front of an audience, but it's played um, through a, uh, a fifteen watt uh, battery busking amp. Basically, when you, with a fence, it's almost like it's an inverse proportion thing, that the longer the fence, the more of the harmonic series becomes available at the top end. And even the most sort of crass piece of wire, it's, a, it's available. And that's one of the sort of fascinating things about some, playing something that's so long, the, the deeper you go, the lower you go, the more you've got up top too. It's kind of a... Um, not only is it is it the science of sound and, and probably the only rule there is in music, um, it's like to find it in the middle of that's the Udnadatta track, <laughs> which is three days drive from Sydney. Oh, we've got to go to the left again. <laughs> Flies. Flies in Australia are um, your ever uh, available audience, and um, we'll try to get into every orifice available. And um, yeah, well, I'll just finish with this, and then we're going to have a short break and go on to the other project. Oh. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so if any questions specifically on this? What kind of bow do you use? Um, those are cello bows, but you can use anything, actually. Um, violin bows are, qu are kind of good because they're, they're faster and lighter. I mean, did, did the, the thing is everybody says, well, you must wreck a few bows you know, playing fences. <laughs> actually, you don't if your technique is good enough. And even playing barbed wire. Can I find that? Just a, there's a second. There's the barbed wire bit. You know, it's on a separate thing. Anyway, it's actually... Oh, there it is. <laughs> so this is just some uh, some arpeggio practice, early morning practice um, on the bar. <laughs> Don't fuck up! YouTube hit actually. I think it's like like ridiculous amount of people have been there. Um, so why don't you slide down it on your, on your ass? Um, anyway, so any quick questions on that before we move? Yep, just um, shout. Do you ever experiment with using different types of string? String. Yeah, for the bow. Uh, for the sorry for the fence. Yeah, like using different uh, string on the bow on fences. Uh, yes, I. I mean, let's not go there, but there's, I, I have bows of all kinds of, uh, I have bows with piano wire on them, so you get like, uh, yeah, I couldn't find it immediately, but the, if you look for it, it's there, and so you, there you get a very interesting sort of phasing effect, because the bow itself, of course, makes a sound, and as you go from, say, um, the, 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 the frog to the point of the bow, with the wire on the bow, and it's changing two basic systems. It's like putting two waveforms together on the synthesizer. And it's, uh, it makes an extraordinary sound. Plus there are many kinds of bows that I've sort of made. I've made short ones and there's, uh, oh, the, there's a great technique that the Koreans came up with ages ago, who knows how long ago, which they, they didn't use bow hair, they just used a uh, uh, stick and put notches in. And so you get it also rhythm applied to the bow if you use a notch piece of wood. And there's a very famous story that um, this Italian, sort of second-rate Italian composer, wrote a violin concerto for Paganini, a guy by the name of Val Dabrini. And Paganini thought it was such shit, he played it with a piece of reed with, with notches on. So um, there's nothing new. It's like it's <laughs> just got to know where to look. Next to the question, there was another one down yeah. there. Yeah, um, have you ever come across the electric fan stuff? Um, oh, yes. It's usually like, what is it? I don't know what it actually is, but I guess it's like a thin copper wire inside and it's usually wrapped in like kind of nylon or something. Uh, like it depends. I mean, in, in, in the do it yourself world of Australian farming, they, they make their own fences, and what they do is they have a plastic bucket and they put a bunch of like grapefruits in there and stick two electrodes in and got an electric fence and yes you do get an electric shock if you play an electric fence <laughs> I've actually got the audio to play you I mean if I it'll slow things down if I go believe me but it's actually on on my website if you go to Great Fences of Australia and the actual disc of it it's the track that's featured so there's this click um, from from the direct current and that click is audible too so it's oh, kind of it's like it's like a DJ you know so record, you record click pulses, Sorry? Doesn't it go in pulses sometimes? Like uh, yes, yeah, but I don't... I, to be honest, it does hurt. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I once did a gig in, um, in Finland uh, for a dancer, and, and she wanted a kind of a fence thing, and I put this fence up in, um, in this kind of... Uh, the concert hall of the little town. It's about halfway up uh, Finland in the Lake District. And every time I touched it, I got a hell of a belt out of this thing. And it was like, you know, it was all insulated. There was, no, and I, I spoke to the, the guy. I said, you know, is this, this is normal. He said, yes, everybody is electrocuted here. And it's like, <laughs> so I just played this concert. You know, every time I knew I was going to get a shock every time I played this damn thing. So I played like for half an hour. You know, thinking, what can I, not through the fingers again. Yeah. Another question. All right, let's I, move. Have, I have a footnote. Um, uh, John, uh, as, as you now could pick up, 
uh, John has a website with where you can run a drone for days. Uh, you can and, waste your entire life. And find things. Um, but um, uh, uh, John made the point uh, not only to play Australian fences, but uh, he played fences around the entire world. And every time he comes back, he has some new story to tell. I was very impressed when he played the fences on the Golan Heights. Uh, no, the extra separation fence. Oh, the extra yeah. separation fence. Yeah. The, the thing about you know, eighteen-year-old guards on the who work for the Australian Defence Force who guard the fences, they they do like to shorten your life if you give them the chance. So playing that, that's you can look that up. Oh. I mean, you just if you go on projects, you'll see. Am I oh, wrong side of the thing? No, this is really playing up. I'm right over on the left side. Ah. Anyway, under projects, you'll see fences of the world, and if you go to the Israeli fences, you'll see a little clip there that the, the television made of me being. Uh, well, they've got the grenades out, you know. <laughs> And the other one is, is the border between Mexico and USA. That's the best wonderful fence to play because on the Mexican side, they're all going, yeah, it's cool, yeah, music, nice. Yeah. And on the American side, there's like helicopters zapping you and <laughs> <laughs> guards coming up and doing your own. Anyway, um, so try to move to... Uh, ah, okay. I was just, I don't know why I had that. So, yeah, like. I, I, I wanted to have a little bit of. Oh, of this. Project, okay. But uh, you can do this afterwards or. It, it's okay. I mean, it's really, you have to you guide, to guide it. I, I, but I wanted the, the main project, the second project I want to talk about was this sort of bicycle power project. Mm -hmm. But um, I know some of you, because Kirsten has told me, make, you know, are interested, you have our demo boards and you make stuff with, to do with this. And so there are a lot of interactive projects which I've made, they're normally environmental projects, but they all come from the violin because I've since 1985 I've worked in conjunction with a studio in Amsterdam called Stein which is about uh, people being able to have real time uh, digital applications for, uh, for musicians to be on stage and work with stuff. So I, I worked with Stein for a long time. The first thing I wanted to do there was make a bow which was interactive. So this was, uh, you can go online and look at this up. There's heaps of it. But it's like, um, so what can you do to make a bow interactive? Well obviously there's bow pressure, the first thing. So the first thing I did was put a, a, a pressure sensor from a DX7 keyboard into it, a pressure sensor, and that worked quite well. So that's gave me one reading. And then beginning of the 90s, accelerometers came into sort of being in terms of accessible price-wise. And so I got into accelerometers also, which gave you X, Y, Z parameters. So you immediately got something which is actually modeling the bow. Anyway, I had three or four different prototypes. I mean, this is all homemade stuff held together with rubber bands and bits and pieces. You know? um, but I, the, the most recent evolution of this was a, was a company on the west coast, like a typical cowboy um, Silicon Valley kind of company, so they, they made a, a bow which was a, quite amazing it's, got, it's called the K-Bow, you can look it up online um, if you haven't been to Glasgow on the 9th of May, I'm playing it um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and so there's a, it's a fiberglass bow and it's got an aerial in it, so it's very beautiful at measuring actual sort of distance and for scratching samples and stuff. It's just perfect. And uh, also you can use it as a switch. So with uh, ultrasound, you can switch out of the system and back into the system just by taking it away. So there's, there's many things. So this is what, this was the area where I, why I got involved with interactive electronics and the digital world because of the violin. And then from that, it doesn't take an Einstein to see that you can apply this to various things. So um, let's just look at some of these, since Kirsten suggested this. So um, this is a kite project. These are radio transmission projects. Yeah.
So just to the background, so there are accelerometers which are measuring the kite. This is being transmitted by, I think it was a British company, EB was the actual transmitter. Um, things work very well in the outback. You try this in a city and you're screwed because there's so much stuff going on. You, know, you just get wiped off the planet. And we also uh, put three security cameras on the kite as well, which they're, they're pretty flaky in terms of quality, but because they, 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 they can't deal with moving images, you get all these kinds of distorted stuff. Plus, when they look back down at the Earth, they have such a fisheye kind of lens on them that the Earth actually suddenly becomes a little ball as you're... You'll see. Let's get them up now. And the sound itself that's being that's being modulated is actually the sound of an organ pipe, a diapason, one single pipe. And that's all down on the desert with the PA system. with a um, colleague of mine, Bob Ossertag, and here I've got accelerometers on a, um, it is a kayak nutcase. This is in San Francisco Bay, and we actually... When he goes underwater, it's kind of amazing because first time he does it. loud and clear from where we were so he was hearing it and also we of course it's America so you need to have a crowd of about a hundred people going oh, hey. <laughs> just want to find where he goes under the water it's just application of this stuff is, but you know, as I'm sure you all know by now, but it, it was exciting in the 80s, the idea that the real world, any, any signal, or more importantly, a differential between signals could be translated into MIDI, it was like a, it was an exciting place to be. I also did a lot of sport pieces, I guess you could see the Big Ball project. Uh, Most of us have seen the Big Ball project. Oh, then we I'm won't very, bother to go there then. I'm very fond of the Big Ball, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but we're heading to the bicycle, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, sh shall we have a little break? Why not? Yes.
Take some books. It's a lot of information.